UConn finally found a plane to take them to Arizona. Can they also find their way to immortality? You are Locked On College Basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, what's up? Welcome into the Locked On College Basketball Podcast, the only daily national college hoop show out there. Happy Final Four Eve. It is Friday. We're your hosts. The handsome big bear to my right is not Jason Kelsey. That's Andy Patton. <laughs> I'm Isaac Shade. Did you see that in the chat the other day, Andy? Somebody said uh, during. I did. I did. I take that as a tremendous compliment. I'm Honestly, happy to be compared to, to Jason Kelsey. I, funny enough, I've never heard the Travis side of it. So that's I, weird. you know, I was a center in when I played football too. Not nearly at the extent that he made it to. It was like freshman year of of high school that I stopped, but I played the same position. So I'll take it. that. Honestly, way to go. <laughs> Folks, you're joining us at the place to get your college basketball content every single day. Thanks for making us your first watch or listen. By the way, if you want to listen, you can do so ad-free on Amazon Music. We're really grateful for our partnership with them and for their plastering Locked On College Basketball in Times Square this past week. Special shout out, by the way, to all you everydayers. Thanks for joining us. We love the support we've been getting throughout this month. It is a joy to be with you every single day, literally. Coming up on the show today, plenty of Final Four discussion as we are just one day, as I said, from the last two games before the national championship. Plus, the must bus is headed west, leaving Fayetteville, Arkansas and Walmart land and headed out to La La Land. Who else is hopping on that bus? We'll get to that. Also, shout out to Seton Hall for winning the NIT, despite the fact that they should have been in this big dance, Andy Patton. But way to go, Shaheen Holloway. It was uh, that uh, that Magic St. Peter's run a couple years ago, now proving the haters wrong. Andy, I joked about it in the cold open, but this whole thing with, with UConn's plane troubles, of course, Danny Hurley, you know, just needed one more manufactured slight <laughs> to help uh, himself and his team get over the hump on saturday andy are we just making a big deal about not much here with this thing of course yeah i mean yes that's absolutely what's happening and like look everybody has experienced plane trouble and and the description of what happened for them how long they were on the tarmac and and just the, the i mean it sounds awful like i'm not gonna i'm not gonna Honestly. sugarcoat that like it doesn't sound like it was an unpleasant experience that kind of stuff is nightmarish and not getting out till like one in the morning or whatever it was that sucks but like it's just life. Like it's not, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it wasn't the day before the game. Like it's, they have enough time to recover. Like everybody's going to be fine. Like this isn't going to have an impact on the game. It shouldn't. Um, but yeah, Danny is absolutely going to play it up. He already has, he's admitted as much to playing it up of like, you know, this perceived slight type thing and, and uh, kind of more fuel to the fire for this UConn team. And it's, it's, it's a silly thing. It's not that big of a deal, but I think that like, nobody seems to be making it a big deal. Like you, you, you know, you listen to Danny's press conference about it and he's not like hopping mad or anything. He said, Oh, it was stressful, but you know, we got through it. And Nate Oates made a joke about how well he slept last night, which I thought was kind of funny. Like, oh, honestly. Yeah. Oh, it's just one of those things. Like it, it's just a, it's a, an unfortunate thing that happened for UConn. Like we're not going to pretend it doesn't suck, but it's also in the grand scheme of things, it's just not that big of a deal. If this was the start of the tournament or any time in the regular season, it's a, it's pretty much a non-story. It's just, there are only four teams left and we happen to, you know, be talking about the the biggest team uh, right now. And so of course it's going to get a lot of headlines. Yeah. I feel like it happened like for the first round at some point last year, if I'm remembering. Probably. Correctly. Yeah. But, this isn't um, that uncommon of a story. No. And obviously, I mean, this is on the NCAA. They arrange all the travel. So there's yeah. that. But certainly not as black of an eye as uh, messing up the measurement of the three-point line yeah. in the women's games last right. weekend. Anyway, Andy, speaking of this UConn team, something we, you and I have been talking about a little bit is, is a slight comparison to the almost undefeated 2015 Kentucky team. Obviously, this UConn team is not undefeated. They've lost three times this year, as we've discussed. But we compare them in like juggernaut status level mm -hmm. because that Kentucky team was absolutely rolling. But Andy, here's the thing for me. We've been talking about this UConn team has the opportunity to be legendary, to be remembered as potentially one of the greatest teams of all time. If they can double up on what they did last year. But Andy, when you think back to the 2015 season, do you remember I mean, obviously, we remember Kentucky's undefeated run all the way to the Final Four, where they lost to Wisconsin, but it was Duke that won the national championship. Duke's lone one-and-done national championship. 
That's what we remember, Andy, not Kentucky. Kentucky is a, a footnote to Duke's national championship. Translation, if UConn wants to be remembered as not only legendary, but immortalized in college basketball lore, it can't just be a Final Four run, right? And they've yeah. got to finish this thing off and get one shining moment. 100%. Yeah. And I, and I think it highlights uh, part of a longer conversation about rings culture in general and just That's a, 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 a re, not renewed, but a, a more passionate emphasis lately on like if you don't win a championship. And it's it's a, a it's a conversation that's focused primarily on professional sports, but it has kind of leaked down to college sports where I just don't think it translates as well. Like there's 30 NBA teams. And if you play in the NBA for 10, 12, 15 years and you never win a championship, I think it still gets held against NBA players more than it should. But it's it, it, when you only play four years in college, maybe five, and there's 360 other teams. It's just, it's a little silly to determine, you know, a player or a team's program's worth based on championships. I've always thought that it was a little bit over, over exaggerated how important a championship or even a final four is. But I do like this comparison in some ways, obviously, like you said, UConn not undefeated in the regular season, the way that Kentucky was, but uh, what, what stood out to me when we were talking about it is, is Kentucky dominated all their games and then had a close game. They only beat Notre Dame by two in the elite eight. And then the follow-up game they lost. And when I was thinking about that, it reminded me of the 2021 Gonzaga Bulldogs who mm. are also a team that, that, will are remembered a lot now because it's only three years ago, but five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, more people are going to remember Baylor than they're going to remember that Gonzaga team, even though that Gonzaga team was undefeated until the national championship game. But Gonzaga rolled through all of their games in the NCAA tournament until they played UCLA in the final four. Most people remember what happened in that game. Jalen Suggs hit an incredible banked in 37 footer uh, to prevent that game from going into overtime to send UCLA home. But then they lost the next game to Baylor. So you have two instances of teams winning a bunch of games by double digits, winning a close game, and then losing the following game. Could that happen here to UConn, where if UConn does win this game, does beat Alabama, but instead of winning by 15 or 20 or 30, like they've done for half of the games they've played uh, up to this point in the tournament, if they only win this one by five, if it actually comes down to a close game, if they have to win it at the free throw line, uh, which I think is possible. Like I, I still expect UConn to win this game, uh, but I, I wouldn't be that surprised if Alabama gives them a really good game. In fact, I, I kind of think that's likely. Does that put, potentially put UConn in a position where regrouping from a, their first close game in, in weeks puts them in a position where if they end up playing Purdue or even NC State, it doesn't matter. They, they're they maybe not as prepared for that game. And, and like, again, mm. just because it happened to Kentucky nine years ago, just because it happened to Gonzaga three years ago, doesn't mean it's going to happen to UConn this year. But it is interesting to be able to kind of look at, at those results and, and see how that could potentially play out for UConn this year as well. Yeah, very much so. Andy, that's such an interesting point about the game before that game where they both lost, how Gonzaga had that just very close victory over UCLA. I think Kentucky won – they're their elite eight game by just two points. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so really interesting with that. Now, obviously, Andy, we've just been UConn in this thing and, and we're mm -hmm. going to obviously have more conversations about their place in history, depending on what they do this weekend. Yeah. But I, 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 Alabama is just getting treated as an afterthought here. And mm -hmm. as you said, this Crimson Tide team is here for a reason. Yeah. Um, they, I, I mean, obviously, I think the smart thing to do is say UConn should win this. Like I'm, mm -hmm. I'm over like saying, Oh, this is the team that's finally going to give UConn a game. Cause I, <laughs> anybody that says that just keeps getting made to look yeah. silly. Well, I'm not going to sit here and say that. Cause I think UConn continues their 13 or more scoring win margin, but Alabama, as we've talked about, has the possibility. And Andy, I think it's one of the, you know, we talked about major storylines with these teams this week. One of the things we didn't say, is how interesting that Alabama is doing this the year after they were the number one overall seed and lost early, the year after they had Brandon Miller, who was, you know, essentially, if not for Zach Eady, would have probably been national player of the year last year, mm -hmm. right? Like, but it's now the year after that where they're really rising to the top. What does this say about Nate Oates and his staff and the guys they've got in? Yeah, it's interesting. I, I, I'd like to point out, I'd like to say that like, oh, sometimes teams kind of who are flying a little bit more under the radar, go on and win championships or go, you know, advance farther like UConn last year is a good example as a team that was only a four seed and wasn't really a team that was on the radar as a national champion. But now UConn is, 
you know, a, a similar team, but they were the number one seed and, and they're in the same position. So it doesn't always matter. It's not always uh, under the radar teams that win it. I know as somebody who's plugged in with the Gonzaga basketball fandom, a lot of people assume that when Mark Few and Gonzaga does get over the hump, it'll be a team that's like a six seed and not a team that's the number one seed. I don't know how much validity there is to the idea of, oh, there's a little bit less pressure, a little bit less of a target on our back, and therefore we're going to have more success. But when using this specific back-to-back years for Alabama as an example, you can kind of see how that might be the case. Like there was obviously a lot going on at Alabama last year. They I, they were a, a team in the news for reasons outside of just being the number one overall seed. And that I'm sure had an impact. And we, we didn't see Brandon Miller play particularly well once the tournament rolled around. And for this year's team, I think it's less about them being un, like seated as a four seed. It's more about like Mark Sears did absolutely did not want to go out the same way he went out last year. Like this is a determined young man who was like, I came here to go to a final four and dang it, I'm going to do it. And I think his leadership and Nate Oates' ability as a coach to kind of get out of his way and figure out, okay, what can we do with the personnel that we have? And and guys like Grant Nelson and Jaron Stevenson stepping up at times when they kind of weren't consistently that great throughout the year. I mean, it, th- right. this is the recipe to, to make a run like this is you have guys step up who weren't playing well previously. You have a veteran senior leader who who's just putting the team on his back. Like, it, you know, you kind of put together a recipe list of ways to make the final four. Like those are things that are on it. And I do think in, in a lot of ways coming off of a season where you failed to meet expectations sometimes results in that, like this is not unheard of to kind of do go farther the year after you had those high expectations. And, and you kind of lump that in with everything else that's going well for Alabama right now. And you can kind of see, like, I didn't project it, uh, you know, in my my bracket, I had Charleston winning in the first round, which I did last year against San Diego State. And guess what? San Diego State went to the final four last year, too. Uh, but I can see kind of looking at the recipe here why this is working for Alabama. All right. Andy, UConn, Alabama, the late tip on Saturday, 849 approximately Eastern time on TBS. UConn is favored at FanDuel by 11 and a half. We talk a little bit about uh, Alabama going on a bit of a, a redemption tour for themselves, but Purdue, Isaac, that's obviously the biggest redemption tour. NC State, they're on a miraculous run. But folks, something is going to have to give on Saturday evening. We got more on that, but first. I want to tell you about today's sponsor, Robinhood. Folks, did you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement, you can still have an IRA? Robinhood has the only IRA that gives you 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, Robinhood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer in from other retirement accounts with a 3% match. That's right, no cap on that 3% match. Robinhood Gold gets you the most for your retirement thanks to their IRA with a 3% match. This offer is good through April 30th. Get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscription fees apply. And now for some legal information, the claim as of quarter one, 2024 is validated by Radius Global Market Research. Investing involves risk, including loss. Limitations apply to IRAs and 401ks. The 3% match requires Robinhood Gold for one year from the date of the first 3% match. Must keep Robinhood IRA good for full five years. The 3% matching on transfers is subject to specific terms and conditions, and Robinhood IRA is available to U.S. customers in good standing, and Robinhood Financial LLC member SIPC is a registered broker-dealer. All right, Isaac, we talked UConn, Alabama there in the first segment. We want to talk about this Purdue-NC State matchup as well. Game is scheduled for 6.09 Eastern time on Saturday. It'll be on TBS, of course. Uh, a one seed versus an 11 seed. That is the intrigue here. You have just two really great stories. Yeah. You have Purdue bouncing back from last year's loss to a 16 seed. Uh, you have NC State, a team that literally shouldn't be in the NCAA tournament. They were a 10 seed in the ACC, a conference that was considered pretty weak this year, although I think they kind of curbed a lot of that with how they performed in the NCAA tournament. But regardless, most teams that finish 10th in their conference are not even making the NCAA tournament in any conference, and they're certainly not making the Final Four. But Kevin Keats's team won five games in a row to win the ACC automatic bid, got an 11 seed, boom, they are still here. These two teams both have incredible stories, and really it's just a shame that one of them has to lose, but at least they made it this far, and I think it's it's fun to be able to look at these two teams and see these two incredible storylines story converging uh, into this matchup on Saturday. And Andy, I think that goes back to what you were saying about rings culture earlier. Mm-hmm. 
um, because completely agree. Like, mm -hmm. it, it's just a bummer that one of these stories is going to end. We have loved following these two teams um, throughout this run. Um, but man, I, as Andy was talking about earlier, I just want to reiterate that. Let's make sure to celebrate these accomplishments, man, to, to see Purdue rising up from that, the mess of last year, making it to a Final Four. That in itself is incredible. The fact that NC State, as Andy said, just even made it into the, you know, we've talked about all the things that had to go right. And they, here's another one we haven't talked about in the ACC tournament. Virginia should have fouled up three, right? Like mm -hmm. there's just so many things like yep. that. But here they are, and they've made it to a Final Four. This will be remembered in Raleigh, North Carolina for the rest of this program's history, Andy. And mm -hmm. I love that. So, folks, make sure you celebrate that, even as one of these teams will end their run on Saturday night. And, and Andy, when you, when you think about the, the just beautiful humanity of this, two things that I wanted to, to look back on, on from Sunday when Purdue punched their ticket is one of the favorite things I've ever seen is, look, I'm sure. How tall are you, Andy? Six foot on the dot. Oh, I hate you. I'm 5'11", like, right? I've never <laughs> seen six on the thing. So I got to climb the ladder like everybody else. Watching Zach Eady just mm -hmm. walk up to the net and just <laughs> reach up and clip it without climbing. Like, it's first off, it's a slap in the face to Werner Ladders, who've bought sponsored that thing forever. But it honestly it was brilliant. But Andy, the even more of the humanity. Um, mm -hmm. for, for our long, younger viewers and listeners, you might not know this name, but Zach Eady cut his piece of the net and then he went a step further and cut it in half. And he took it over to Gene Cady, who was the long, 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 long time coach of Purdue. Coached Matt Painter, in fact. Mm -hmm. And took half of his piece of the net to Coach Cady, who was right there on the court. Coach Cady, you know, tipped his cap. And the, the adoring Purdue crowd loved it. I mean, Robbie Hummel's over there in tears. Mm -hmm. at the, I mean, it's just, Andy, how can you not get caught up in the emotion of that, man? That's what yeah. this stuff is all about. Yeah, and I think it's it's unfortunate because, like, yeah, like we said, a lot of people will will if Purdue loses this game, and while you know, and Purdue goes on this this incredible run after losing to a 16 seed, they go all the way to the Final Four, they dominate in the round of 32, they pick up you know a double digit win over Gonzaga, a really nice win over a very very good Tennessee team, make the Final Four after that. Like, if they lose to NC State, they they won't get remembered the way that they should. Right. Zach Eady will still always be remembered as a great player, but this will hang over his head. And it's just unfortunate that that will be the reality of the situation. And I think, I mean, and I, I don't want to say that NC State winning is bad because it's not, but it's certainly bad for Purdue. It's bad for their reputation. And frankly, if NC State were to win and UConn were to beat NC State by 25 points, that's a hypothetical scenario here, but that's going to impact how people perceive this UConn team. And, and I don't, I think that's completely unfair. If that were to happen, but I think that that like that situation could be a reality if NC State can pull off this upset here. Now I have a hard time seeing NC State doing it, but as I've said on this show before, I didn't think they'd beat Marquette. I thought they had a better chance against Duke, but I didn't think they'd beat Marquette. I'm That's not even sure point. I had them beating Texas Tech in the first round, although that wasn't as shocking, certainly. But like it's it, it's unfortunate that that narratives get driven based entirely on who actually wins the championship because this Purdue like there, there's a lot more pressure on Purdue right now than there is on NC State. Like NC right. State is the epitome of playing with house money. Like it doesn't <laughs> like it, it's not that it doesn't matter, but losing this game is it's still like they have far, far exceeded expectations, but Purdue has not. They have they have done well, but they haven't exceeded expectations. And that puts a, a bit more of a target on them in terms of like how they're going to be perceived, regardless of how this game goes. Everybody's anticipating UConn-Purdue. That is the expectation. There's a lot of reasons for that. They're not just one seeds for no reason, obviously. Uh, but if it isn't that, I think that whichever those teams lose, or if we get a shocking Alabama-NC State championship, uh, then the, the narrative around those teams <laughs> is going to be very negative when I don't think that it should be. Andy, I like, I haven't really even stopped to consider that as a reality. Right. I, no, most people haven't. <laughs> but what if man, like right. what? 
Oh, my word. Well, if it doesn't happen that way, which, by the way, I'm looking up the FanDuel line for that matchup really quick. NC State versus Alabama, Crimson Tide by four and a half at FanDuel, folks, if you're one to get adopted, I was going to guess five and a half. Really oh, I should have given it. So, uh, but by the way, if it's the other two teams, I looked up this number today, Andy. It will be the 10th time since we started seeding teams back in 1979 that the national championship will feature a one seed versus a one seed. Most recently, that game you mentioned earlier, uh, mm -hmm. Baylor over Gonzaga back yeah. in 2021. Speaking of teams that win the national championship, Andy, there's some qualifications that you and I often look at and talk about. And we, we just want to point out two of those on their way to, on our way to, excuse me, a fun little game we're going to play in segment three. Stick with us for that. Um, Andy, I'll do the Ken Palm one. I'll leave you the, the three point one. At Ken Palm, we're looking for these teams that are balanced offensively and defensively, where offensively they find themselves in, um, excuse me, <clears throat> offensively they find themselves top 10 in uh, offensive efficiency. We've had a few outliers, 17, 19, and 39, but in the Ken Palm era, we've had 24 national champions. 21 of them have finished top 10 in Ken Palm offensive efficiency. On the other side, all 24 have finished top 22 in defensive efficiency. The only, the lowest ranked team actually was that Baylor team. They were 22nd in Ken mm -hmm. Palm defensive efficiency. So Andy, of our four remaining teams, two fit this bill, two don't. And not surprisingly, mm -hmm. it's UConn and Purdue that are within the threshold. And it's Alabama and NC State that don't. UConn is one and four in offense and defense. Purdue is two and 17. Alabama fits it offensively, but not defensively, as I'm sure everyone knows by this point, mm -hmm. third in offensive efficiency. So we've got the top three offensive yeah. efficiency teams in the nation, but 105 in defense. And then NC State is kind of middling in both 40th in offense, 44 in defense, so they don't fit either. It's funny to have the one, two, three, and 40th ranked offenses. <laughs> <laughs> Just proof of how much of an outlier NC State is. And, and they're they're a bit of an outlier, although not as much, uh, in three-point percentage as well, which three-point percentage has been uh, a huge kind of marker for success uh, in terms of winning the national championship as well. Uh, you always want to be above that 33% threshold, I think. 32.9 is the absolute cutoff for any national champion. But realistically, very, very, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but very few teams have won with a three-point percentage under 35 right. as a team. And only one of these four teams, you can probably guess who, is below that 35% mark. That is NC State. Granted, they are at 34.7%. So they are very close. And they are, in fact, very, only a little bit behind UConn who is at 35.8%, while Alabama is next at 37.1%, obviously a very proficient three-point shooting team and a very high-volume three-point shooting team for the Crimson Tide. And then Purdue is number one in three-point percentage among the final four. They're actually number two in the entire country at 40.6%. And we've talked about it so, so many times on the podcast, but still I think it's important for people to note that Purdue is not just Zach Eady. This is a team that shoots lights out from three and the ability to space the floor and shoot the three is part of what makes Zach Eady so impactful on the block and what makes Matt Painter such a great coach and what makes this team go the way that they do. Andy, it's six teams that have fallen under 35% out of 36 national champions we've had in the three-point era. Andy, these four teams are chock-a-block full of talent at every <laughs> position how would the two of us go about crafting a dream team of a 3v3 tournament for these squads? We're going to play that game in just a second. Right after I tell you that this episode is brought to you by our great friends at Game Time. Y'all, the final four is tomorrow in Phoenix. Hopefully you have a plane unlike UConn and you weren't initially planning on going, but now you want to get there. We can't help you with that airfare or hotels, but getting into the games? Game time's got you covered on that one. Or for some of you, your team's done and out and you've already given up on the tournament and moved on. Well, Game Time is now an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets even faster and easier. In fact, prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to the first pitch. They've got killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and a lowest price guarantee. With that, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets. That one of their deals that I love is last minute deals. You save up to 60% by buying last minute tickets for sports, but also concerts, um, comedy, theater, and more. 
Andy, something I worry about is if I'm buying third party tickets that it's going to be bogus and I'll get turned away. But Game Time has Game Time ticket coverage. And that means your purchase is covered by the most flexible customer service policy in the ticketing industry. I love Love that peace of mind. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the app, create an account, and use code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply, though. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On College for twenty dollars off. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. All right, Andy Patton and I. This is my announcer voice are going to have a 3v3 draft. We're going to draft the best three-on-three team we can from the final four teams. We're going to do it snake draft style, just like you would in fantasy football draft or whatever it is you do. So round one, Andy, then Isaac. Round two, Isaac, then Andy, and we'll go three rounds. And I know that's completely unfair to me, but I'm a man of the people, and I want to give my man an advantage here. So Andy, since you have all this, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, so folks, we, we'd love to hear who you draft with this too. Let us know. But Andy, you get the first pick. Who are you going with? Yeah, I'm going with Zach Eady. <laughs> Not no, a lot of that's, mystery that's there. Silly. I almost typed it in the notes before we even finished the, the read there because I, I think it's pretty clear that that's who we're going with. Um, Eady is is so – I mean, not just big, obviously, but he's so talented and he's versatile defensively and offensively. You know, he's not going to space the floor or anything like that, but he creates a situation where uh, there's pretty much one player that you have to take with one of your next two picks. Uh, otherwise, uh, you're going to be in a world of hurt in a three on three game against Zach Eady if you can't find somebody to adequately defend him. Yeah, you forced my hand here, but I want to take Mark Sears first. Because... Oh, he's going to be great against Zach Eady. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, honestly, just for the just to honor Mark Sears because of what he's done. I mean, he's an absolute baller. Give me Mark Sears. And then, yes, as you force my hand, my second pick to kick off round two is none other than UConn's Donovan Klingon. Yeah, hard to hard to argue with uh, with Klingon. I would if if you hadn't taken him for the record, I would have just so you couldn't take him with your last pick, uh, and just so I would have a Twin Towers lineup there. But uh, since you did take him, I'm going to go with Braden Smith. Uh, it's tough between him and Newton. I mean, there's a strong argument either way in terms of wanting a, a point guard who can do a variety of different things. Uh, you know, factoring in the the element of Edie and Smith having a, a prior relationship and knowing each other, uh, those two guys in a two man game in a three on three situation would be lethal uh, but I want to add to my defense a little bit I already got Edie who's a phenomenal defensive player of course but give me Stefan Castle with my final pick here uh, he's a he's a wing he can kind of play the the middle position between Smith and Edie uh, I don't want to go with all Purdue players so that's part of it but uh, Castle's a great defensive player he's not a great shooter and so I think floor spacing isn't an area that that this particular three-on-three -three team would, would uh, be successful but it's three-on-three -three, you want high-level athletes Castle is absolutely that so give me Smith Castle and Edie here yeah man i like that i'm taking cam spencer andy for two reasons i want two shooters on my team mm -hmm. i'm just gonna render zach Eady pointless in this game yeah. um cam spencer hits 44 percent of his threes and he takes 5.7 a game but also here's the other thing this he might look like just this nerdy white dude but <laughs> cam spencer's dirty man yeah. he's gonna get up into you he's gonna yell at you he's got that danny hurley dna all up in him <laughs> i want cam spencer on my three on three team he and sears hitting from outside his teammate clinging on the inside making your boy zach Eady look just silly i'm winning this game it's no it's good that would be a great three on three game right there man really fun game all right and we talked about it earlier in the week, the possibility that the must bus was leaving Fayetteville after about what, five. Has he had five years at Arkansas? Five years. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, about where he, that's where he about where he maxes out at every stop is about five years. <laughs> Shots fired. I love it. <laughs> uh, so that means that uh, uh, you can expect the must bus to be in uh, at USC through the 25, 26, 27, 28, through the 29 season. And then we'll have wow. to start looking for somebody else in LA, but Andy, it is official now. Uh, he has been hired at USC. So there's a whole litany of questions. Andy, I'll throw out a couple, and then I'll let you answer whatever of that you want to. There's been rumors this week about Bronny James entering the transfer portal. Does this change that? Uh, obviously, in the transfer portal era, we see players all the time picking up and following their coach to their new destination. So who can he take with him from Arkansas or, you know, almost Arkansas, mm -hmm. if you put it that way? And then, Andy, I think... The third question, most importantly, is who does Arkansas turn to now? Who do you back up the Brinks truck for to try to follow up the must bus? 
I'll give you a quick answer on all of them. Can he keep Bronny? Yes, I think so. I think that his offensive, uh, the way that he coaches his style, I think is good for Bronny. And I think he's likely going to stay to play for, for Moss. I don't, I, I don't want to say I know that for sure. I just think it's more likely that this coach who has a re- done a really good job of navigating the transfer portal can keep somebody like Bronny in the mix at USC. Uh, who will he take with him? Well, we already know Josh Cohen. Josh Cohen did never actually played at Arkansas, but he trans- he committed to Arkansas this offseason. He's a transfer from UMass, put up huge numbers at UMass. And as soon as Musk got hired at USC, he flipped his transfer from Arkansas to USC. So he is heading out west as well. Uh, a big pickup already for Musk and USC. Uh, Khalif Battle has entered the transfer portal from Arkansas as well. No indication that he's, at this point at least, that he is following Musk to USC. But uh, I suspect we'll see a lot of players from Arkansas enter the portal. And I wouldn't be surprised if at least a few of them uh, end up going out to USC as well. And there's three coaches who are being rumored right now for Arkansas that we're hearing, uh, and that is Chris Beard at Ole Miss. I've only been there for one year. If he jumps to another SEC school, it would be certainly a, a storyline to follow. We'll put it that way. Uh, Will Wade got him back into the SEC after his tenure at LSU, and then Jerome Tang at Kansas State. All three of those would be incredibly fascinating hires uh, in Fayetteville. Well, Isaac, that's going to wrap it up for today and sort of for this week, although we will be back live after the game on Saturday night. After the games, I should say, on Saturday night, we'll be recapping those two contests and giving you a very early sneak peek preview of that national championship. Of course, we'll have a full episode on Monday as well, and then we'll go live after that game on Monday night. So a couple more opportunities to hang out with us live after those games. If you haven't done so yet, it's a lot of fun. We love reading those comments and hanging out with everybody live after the game. So check it out on Saturday after the games are over but until then apologies to the lawyer family let's go wildcats and until saturday peace